Welcome back, CSI 2020 Mars. We will pick up with our discussion of hardware architecture, in particular aspects of the modern CPU in just a moment. Prior to that, a few announcements. Again, be scanning along in Brighton and Halloran chapter four on architecture. In this case, again, skimming is probably okay as that chapter is extremely dense and we will not in lecture be getting into all of the details that are present there. And you won't be responsible for all of them come exam time. Bear in mind though, that there are some aspects uh, that will pay dividends in terms of understanding things like what shows up in homework nine, which has now been released and covers timing C code using the built-in time command that's present in most terminals. Uh, there you'll observe some interesting results in terms of the amount of time it takes certain things. Uh, this has a lot to do with the internals of CPU architecture. And in the next lecture, we'll finally get there. Prior to that though, we have a few other internal issues to deal with. Uh, so our goals today are to complete discussion of some of the circuitry that comprises internals of the CPU. Uh, the timing and information we get about internals of the CPU will play out in assignment four, which I'm cooking up and will release sometime this week. Where we left off last time with, was a discussion of this important adder circuit. Uh, full adder, as we saw a moment ago, is comprised of the fundamental gates that you can construct using a variety of physical phenomena. Uh, your XORs, uh, your ANDs, and your ORs. Uh, and essentially a full adder on its own is capable of adding two one-bit numbers together to give a sum and also a form of a carry. Uh, it really comes into its own, though, when you string multiples of these together. And what you see on the right-hand side of the slide, again, is four full adders strung together in the way that they typically are uh, to accomplish a four bit arithmetic. Uh, you can see the pattern here of a single full batter up here, a second full adder here, uh, and those four together are to add up the four bits associated with number A uh, and number B. And so a block diagram for this sort of thing, which is often used to summarize, so presuming the reader knows what the internals of an adder look like, would look something like what's in the lower left form down here, where the number A and the number B, they're comprised of four bits. Uh, those bits are indexed to zero to three. And each of the full adders takes a corresponding bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit three of the numbers uh, A and B. What comes out is the sum of those two numbers and they're connected via carries so that what comes out of this C4 output uh, is whether or not you've overflowed as in the two numbers that you added together uh, were too big to fit in a four bit representation. So then we've seen that uh, these gates can be combined in interesting ways to do arithmetic. Uh, the next major component uh, that we need to look at is one of selection, but before we leave off on uh, arithmetic here, it should be apparent th from this exploration of addition uh, that the bits that you can combine through gates uh, to have addition results such as sums, uh, with the right combination of gates, you could alternatively get subtraction results. And with significantly more complex circuitry, you could probably accomplish things like multiplication and division. Uh, those additional operations, while important for modern processors, are not something that we're going to get into uh, in terms of much detail. Uh, so you're not responsible necessarily even for understanding the full complexity of what's involved in uh, these adder circuits, uh, nor are we going to cover in any sort of accountable way uh, discussions of multiplication and division, but they're out there. And you can imagine based on the algorithms of multiplication and division uh, being more complex than addition, that you'll be using up more gates. And as we saw before, uh, uh, based on the longest path through the circuits dictating how long you have to wait for the circuits to resolve to correct outputs. Multiplication and division, uh, be having more gates involved, will result in a longer wait for the answers to pop up. So with arithmetic in hand, at least generally then, the other major element that we want to look at in terms of what a processor does is some form of selection, as in, in some cases output this, and in other cases output that. If all the processor ever output was the sum of stuff, it would be fairly uninteresting. For that, we will examine a common circuit that will do this uh, called a multiplexer, or MUX uh, for short. The notion of this thing is to take several inputs and then exclusively output one of those inputs based on some selection bits. 
A typical way to understand this is according to this trapezoidal block diagram for multiplexer, you have four inputs coming in. Uh, each of these comprise usually a single bit, A, B, C, and D, and what's going to come out is one of them. If you're interested in multi-bit outputs, then take multiples of these 4 to 1 multiplexers, uh, for instance, four 4-bit four numbers, you'd have four multiplexers stacked next to each other, each carrying a bit of uh, one of those numbers. At any rate, though, uh, just to understand how we choose exactly which of these outputs comes out, uh, you have to understand that there's a second set of inputs over here, uh, selection bits, in this case uh, titled S0 and S1. Uh, by picking the right selection bits that correspond to each of the inputs, uh, one had a set of bits such as 00, zero corresponding to A, another set of bits over here uh, such as 01 uh, corresponding to B, and a third to C and a fourth to D, uh, then the selection bits will dictate which of these inputs, A, B, C, and D, are passed through as the output for Z. And now you can see that these multiplexers come in various sizes and scale up oftentimes uh, to a 16 to 1 all multiplexers. And 16 uh, inputs come in along with commensurate selection bits that will select one of those 16 uh, being passed through of the multiplexer. It should be a point of interest to computer scientists uh, that up here you're seeing that the multiplexers are typically provided in powers of two, as in a four to one, or an eight to one, or a 16 to one, all common powers of two. It's worthwhile to mention then that the selection bits over here are stacking not by doubling there, but instead by increasing by one. The four to one multiplexer has two selection bits, the eight to one, uh, three selection bits, and 16 to one, four selection bits. Uh, those who are canny and acquainted with their powers of two will recognize that uh, for an 8 to 1, for instance, uh, there are eight possible numbers in there, and using three bits, you can establish uh, binary numbers uh, numbered from 0 to 7. And that's why the inputs here are given, in addition to an a letter name, uh, an input number, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and typically the binary representation of these selection bits in some ordering uh, will dictate which of the numbered outputs is, is passed through. So it'd be uncommon to see something like here's a 6 to 1 multiplexer. A uh, 6 to 1 multiplexer be between 4 and 8 would need at least three selection bits, so why not go all the way up to 8 to 1 in that case? And so if you're purchasing a hardware or laying down uh, in silicon, uh, this is the most typical uh, approach. If you move on to look at the actual gate loadout uh, for one of these things uh, beneath the surface of those block diagrams, uh, what you see is something that has reasonable complexity but follows patterns that we established earlier on when we looked at that uh, circuits that comprised a voting circuit or majority circuit. Uh, to sort of summarize here and uh, belie uh, some of the complexity difference saying it's having this NOR gate or our, our, sorry, NAND gate here uh, with three inputs, which you might be required to stack into two, uh, two input gates. Uh, the essential um, way that these multiplexer gates works uh, are to combine the selection bits and the input bits in such a way that you pass only one uh, of these through. And so you see the split for the selection bits uh, coming over here. For instance, S1 uh, is passed without any sort of interruption, uh, sorry, uh, uh, by passing an inversion of the selection bit. Uh, it's passed up here as one input to this uh, NAND gate that it combines with A. Um, so if uh, S1 is a zero, uh, then that'll be inverted by passing through this NAND gate up here uh, to come in as a one into the AND gap. Um, if the other bit, uh, S2 here, uh, is also a zero, uh, then it'll be passed through uh, as a zero and inverted in this NAND gate, uh, and is passed as the second input up here into this NAND gate, um, as a one instead. Uh, so in this case, uh, the inversion of S1 and S2, that's passed up as uh, these two in here. Finally then, uh, if A is a one, uh, then it's passed through uh, as I have a one, one, one here, uh, that's NANDed, uh, so it comes out as a zero, and then it passes throughs here uh, as a, uh, a, a zero that goes in here. In order to determine what the ultimate output is, I'd have to know, in this case, uh, what each of the inputs uh, for the other gates dealing with B, C, and D are.
uh, to that end, you'd look at uh, alternative outputs and find that in each of these cases with a bit of zero and zero for S1 and S2, uh, what will be going into each of these NAND gates uh, will ultimately make uh, the output that's coming out of here uh, uh, false as well. Uh, so the entirety then of the scheme here is to put alternating inputs uh, for S1 and S2 uh, coming into the NAND gates over here uh, so that the only way that what could come out here if S0 or S1 and S2 are zeros uh, is so the selected input A. That if it's a 1, then I'll get a 1 out this way. And if it's a 0, that'll cause the whole thing to collapse because there's nothing else coming in here that would cause uh, the ultimate output to be a 0 as well. It's not tremendously important uh, to me that you go through and understand at a bit level uh, the truth table for this thing and how uh, the complexity of it plays out to select A, B, C, and D. But this is essentially proof of concept uh, that what's happening in terms of the selection bits is we select A, B, C, or D to pass through as the output for Q. Uh, so that if S1 and S2 are 0, as it was uh, described a moment ago, and A is a 0, then we pass a 0 through. If A is a 1, we pass a 1 through, and nothing is, uh, no attention is paid to B, C, and D over here. Uh, to that end, then, uh, to get different kinds of outputs, the, or the CPU to do different kinds of things, the multiplexer is a common circuit that is used uh, to facilitate uh, choices along those lines. Uh, so we'll have a look at how that plays out in uh, just a second. Uh, this next slide combines several of the aspects that we've talked about before, uh, including some of the circuitry that we've examined, uh, to fulfill a simple arithmetic logic unit. Uh, the intent, again, of the arithmetic logic unit uh, is to take two inputs, an A and a B, uh, and do something to them. And in most cases, as you'd be issuing assembling instructions like add or uh, subtract or multiply or and or shift, then it's the arithmetic logic units that carries out these purposes. It should come as no surprise then that this arithmetic logic unit must have some circuitry in it that comprises something for addition, something for anding and oring, and in more complex examples, uh, something, some circuitry that will facilitate shifting, multiplying, and so forth. In the simplest version, uh, this little ALU supports four different operations, which can be carried out on two-bit numbers. Those two numbers, called A and B, have a bit 0 and a bit 1, and you can see that the bits of A and B are fed together, uh, zeroth bit for A and B, into this portion of the ALU, uh, and oneth bit into this portion of the ALU. Importantly, these are essentially modules uh, that comprise the operation that's going to be done, but are then replicated, and you can see an easy extension of this 2-bit, probably to a 4-bit or 8-bit, or in real systems, 32 and 64 bits. Uh, the constituents, then, are an XOR gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, and a full adder. And that's why you can think of this uh, ALU as supporting full, those four operations. It could find the XOR of numbers A and B, the AND of A and B, the OR of A and B, and the sum of them. And so at an assembly level, you'd think of this as supporting an XOR operation, an AND, an OR, and an ADD instruction. Mostly these two uh, segments of the uh, ALU are separate, as in up here there's a ZOR, an AND, an OR, and a full adder, but you'll note here the carry bit for the first full adder is fed down here as an input to the carry in for the second full adder. So you get uh, any carry of a 1 and a 1 for these bits here will carry down and influence uh, the sum bit associated with uh, the oneth bit in this. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at this uh, bit of ALU uh, nonsense, you'll see that uh, there isn't any sort of screening of or notion here uh, that I am either going to XOR or I'm going to add and or I'm going to OR or I'm going to sum these two numbers. Instead, the inputs are fed into all the gates simultaneously. And so to that at the hardware level, all of those operations that are supported are actually all being done simultaneously, not in parallel. Uh, it, to that end, uh, to, in order to select the output for the ALU, uh, which corresponds to which operation you want, you have at the back end of this a uh, multiplexer. And up here are some tiny little uh, indications uh, that an operation is being selected. Using this 8 to 1 multiplexer, you'd have three bits to select which 
output uh, for which operation is going to out eventually come out of the ALU. Uh, so this out zero and out one bits, uh, they are coming directly from the ALU. And the input bits here will be determined uh, which of these inputs here are passed through. Uh, the inputs uh, coming into the uh, multiplexer in terms of uh, their ABC, or in this case, D0 to D7 inputs, these come from the functional parts of the ALU, as in the ZOR, the AND, the OR, and the full adder. They come in as the inputs D0 to D3, uh, down up on the top and down on the bottom. Uh, it's also the case then that we have some additional uh, selection bits, or sorry, not selection, uh, but input bits here that could be passed through eventually to allow this ALU to grow, for instance, to include things like inverting numbers and two's complement, uh, shifting numbers, and so forth down the line. Uh, so then the selection bits up here would correspond to an operation to do. Uh, for instance, it looks like, uh, based on the connection here, uh, if the opcode here, the binary bits that comprise the assembly instruction, uh, started with 000, then the operation that we pass through uh, in both cases for this top multiplexer and the bottom one is the results of zoring these two numbers together, uh, the XOR result. And so the output bits I get over here comprise an XOR operation. Uh, if instead the bits were 1, 1, uh, or sorry, 0, 1, 1, uh, the lowest two bits being 1, that would select the uh, third or my third or fourth, however you want to count it from 0 for 1 indexing, uh, but would select the full adders to be passed through. And so instead, those bits would probably correspond to an add instruction, and through this I'd get the sum bits along with the carry out over here. Uh, this is also going to explain one thing about uh, essentially why you are able to get uh, certain flag bits set irrespective of what the operation is, is that things like the carry bit here, irrespective of whether I'm oring or anding or uh, XORing or adding, the carry bit is always computed uh, by the full adder stuff that's happening internally, whether or not I select that as an output operation. And that carry bit is going to be fed into the flags register, uh, irrespective of, of what it was that I want done. So since all of these operations are being done in parallel, uh, I still get some status update about if I had added, would I have gotten zeros or carries or that sort of thing. Uh, it's interesting then uh, this realm of hardware where you can do things essentially in parallel for free that's actually more complex uh, to try and select upfront which part of the circuit you want to exercise uh, than it is to just do all of them and then select from the computed outputs of these uh, what uh, output is to be passed through as the result of whatever it is that the ALU is doing at this moment. A mention then again of those flags uh, that uh, typical way that an ALU is wired to the rest of the CPU is that this little ALU down here, which summarizes this somewhat complex circuit, which in turn has some block diagrams for multiplication. But we take this whole thing, we call it a trapezoid, uh, an ALU uh, that has an A and B input that we'll call X and Y here. Uh, and irrespective of what I'm doing, uh, opcode zero being addition, opcode one being subtraction, opcode one zero being anding or XORing, uh, irrespective of what I'm doing, uh, always some of the uh, internal stuff that is done in order to compute the results between X and Y, it comes out as these overflow flags, zero flags, carry flags, and so forth. Uh, and those are then available uh, irrespective of what the operation was. Uh, to that end, then, uh, this explains something we observed earlier, uh, that any of the instructions that you would use uh, set these flags, making it possible to do conditional jumps afterwards. Uh, we'll see then uh, later on that compare instructions, uh, which, for instance, exercise essentially the subtraction uh, instruction, uh, except it didn't store the results anywhere. That can be accomplished with most of the CPU uh, circuitry that's in the ALU. It's just that the result uh, isn't kicked out to a register where it'll be stored. Uh, instead, that result is discarded, uh, but the flag bits are still set by virtue of the the, um, the comparison or the test instruction. We should take just a moment to appreciate the difficulties involved in designs like this. Um, looking at a circuit like this, 
Uh, if you practice hard enough, you could probably start to understand all the ins and outs of what's present in it. Uh, but it becomes more and more useful as these things get complex uh, to, to abstract away from it. Uh, for instance, here we didn't draw out all of the gates involved in this 8 to 1 multiplexer, which would be a significant amount of real estate. Uh, instead, we just drew a block diagram to say, here is where I want a multiplexer. Uh, and moving a step forwards, uh, the ALU is oftentimes then summarized as here's a spot where we're going to put this ALU in terms of the logic of the CPU. But in truth, the early CPU designers actually had to lay those gates down by hand on paper someplace uh, in order for the manufacturers uh, to actually have a fighting chance to construct them physically. This involved, I'm told, in the early days of technical drawing. You see some folks uh, demonstrating this here. And it usually had to be done on special medium, uh, special kinds of paper uh, that had parts that you would peel off uh, and deliver to the manufacturer. So they'd draw these things on a very large scale uh, piece of paper and have to actually physically lay down all of the gates. Uh, so you can imagine this takes a steady hand and a lot of practice as you go through. Uh, eventually then the manufacturers that would lay this down on a silicon wafer would use some photo uh, photolithography, I think that's the, the, the word for it, to take this big image on the special piece of paper uh, and shine light through it uh, so that it would cut into a much smaller element uh, this design in silicon. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of this is that your design could be completely uh, flawless. Uh, it's just that things along this uh, processing um, sort of regime uh, could go sideways and influence the eventual product. Uh, there's an anecdote related in recollections of early chip development, an interesting little article uh, that Intel's internal journal put out some time ago, uh, that one of the first products that Intel, uh, this big chip manufacturer nowadays, uh, worked on was a paltry 64-bit random access memory. Uh, I mean, you're thinking gigabytes of RAM these days, but the first few chips uh, early on uh, were measured in bits instead. Uh, unfortunately, this particular one it was designed well, but only had 63 working bits uh, due to someone along the way, uh, perhaps at the manufacturer or perhaps uh, earlier on, uh, drawing the right stuff, but then not quite getting the paper peeled right, uh, which left a little bit of muck, uh, which screwed up the eventual uh, manufactured circuits so that one of the bits was non-functional. I'm sure uh, someone uh, got chewed out uh, for that, uh, but luckily we've moved on these days to somewhat less tedious means uh, to design hardware. That if you were actually to take a modern hardware design class, you probably wouldn't be doing much drawing. Instead, you'd be writing code, more or less. The modern design paradigm usually uses the notion of a compiler uh, of sorts. Uh, and that you lay out in code, such as what's over here uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, VHDL code uh, that encodes a four-bit arithmetic logic units, somewhat like the one we were looking at before. Uh, but you'd lay this down in code, and it would be up to some uh, sort of com back-end compiler uh, to decide the particular hardware that this is going to be manufactured on. Uh, the process that's going to be used to manufacture it uh, can produce certain kinds of gates. And so as you would want an XOR-like behavior and an AND-like behavior, if only uh, what's only available at the uh, sort of gate level is NAND gates, then we'll translate these into multiple gates uh, to affect that. Uh, you can see also that uh, there's some notion of sort of a module or a, a function-like thing here uh, where you'd specify this ALU as an entity then that is reusable. Uh, that this thing becomes more or less like a block diagram with the back-end engine deciding exactly where it's going to put down all those NAND gates on uh, the uh, eventual hardware that's going to be manufactured. And then, uh, according to that placement, optimizing things like wire uh, layout uh, and the maximum uh, length between gates uh, to try to ensure that you get as much speed out of this thing as possible. This, as an artifact, becomes way, way more usable uh, and extendable than, uh, than something like this. Uh, where there's a direct correspondence to what you draw and how you manufacture, uh, but if someone comes up with a better process that uh, now I just don't need to lay it down in NAND gates, uh, but can also use uh, AND and OR gates, uh, then uh, this kind of stuff can be on the back end uh, converted using back end compiler uh, in much the same way that as you would write C code, this is a very, fairly high level entity that the processor can't understand uh, at the outset, uh, but instead it insulates you and makes it somewhat future proof that so long as 
the compiler writers can adapt whatever backend they have to a new processor architecture, then your C code can be made to run on it. So too, so long as this hardware description language uh, can be, the backend can be adapted to a new synthesis process, smaller bar with more gates or with different materials, uh, then this can uh, be used into the future uh, for the manufacturers to continue uh, the investment that they've made there. So most hardware manufacturers are, are greatly enabled uh, by the fact that they have computers that can do this stuff, but the folks that originally built the first few computers uh, did not have such advantages, so did a lot more by hand in that respect. Moving ahead then uh, with this notion, all we've touched so far is combinatorial circuits. Uh, your adders and your multiplexers and even small ALUs are essentially combinatorial circuits that get complex in terms of their logic, uh, but essentially fit into the complexity class of what can be computed uh, that is most narrow. And any sort of theory class that you take on computation would maybe start there, talk about truth tables and statelessness and so forth. Uh, but a true computer, as you would work outwards, has the notion of I'm doing something at this point and saving the results someplace. Uh, finite state machines with the notion of a state baked into the machine itself uh, build upon combinatorial logic. Uh, but if you move farther outwards, you get to the lauded Turing machine, which accounts mainly for what we think of as computable. Uh, these are things that a Turing machine can do. Uh, that's what it means to be computable. And there are very, various different uh, sort of theoretical renderings of this. Uh, but the most important one that we want to discuss at the moment is the notion of time and state being built into the machine. That a Turing machine has a notion of I'm doing this at this time and in the next moment I am going to be doing something else. Uh, and that something else may be dependent on some information that has been stored someplace. Most of us have an intuitive notion of computers as doing this, uh, and the combinatorial logic and combinatorial circuits that we have seen uh, just don't summarize that completely. So let us go about introducing uh, this notion of time and state into the hardware uh, features that we've discussed so far. The first, uh, and perhaps easier to understand, is the notion of time, although state and time will be uh, tied up together, as we'll see in a second. Uh, you need a clock circuit of some kind, uh, one that doesn't change just based on its inputs, but instead, uh, due to our sort of real notion of time, changes over time, that at this point it's outputting zero, and at this next stage it's outputting a one. There are various ways this can be done, but one of the most common in modern CPUs is to make use of quartz crystals that are specially manufactured. Quartz, uh, if manufactured properly, has this interesting physical property that it expands and contracts, and if you apply a con constant voltage to it, uh, perhaps uh, using a power circuit or batteries, uh, or as mentioned up here, some capacitors to make sure there's a con constant voltage applied across it, uh, then what you'll see is that this expansion and contraction of the quartz uh, crystal, uh, according to this electrostriction property, uh, causes it to output an oscillating voltage. Uh, that at one moment the circuits that's attached to this crystal uh, will have a high voltage and then moments later it will have a low voltage uh, and then moments after that it will have a high voltage again uh, and then a low voltage. The little square wave that's demonstrated here is ideal, uh, but it gives you the notion of what's a properly constructed quartz crystal, uh, quartz crystal that's connected to the CPU in the right way, uh, can do in terms of providing some notion of time. Uh, there are a few different aspects of this wave that you would study in physics, uh, for instance, you know, the width or the period of these. Uh, but generally this uh, waveform then is something that you can see as changing and allowing then the CPU to see those changes and react somewhat accordingly. Uh, importantly, we'll want to have a look later on, because it'll matter uh, for this notion of state and registers, uh, that there's a rising edge to this clock uh, signal and a falling edge to this clock signal. Uh, and one of the things that this uh, is going to enable us to do is uh, there'll be some circuitry that reacts only to a rising edge of the clock circuit. Uh, and uh, we'll touch on that in just a second. But generally then, when you talk about the speed of a CPU, it's how fast this clock is ticking. Uh, the shorter the width between these waves, uh, the faster the CPU is gonna see the changes from zero to one. Uh, there are limits to this, that if you get too fast, 
uh, then certain circuitry within the CPU doesn't have chance to stabilize before the clock uh, edge falls again. We'll talk about that uh, again later and relate it to those longest paths that we saw in circuits uh, that you have to wait to resolve, uh, uh, wait for whatever the longest path through some units in your CPU is, for instance, the adders, which have long paths in them. Uh, if you fail to wait, then you may get more or less incorrect results as the clock ticks down. So uh, the last uh, part that I should mention is that quartz crystals themselves don't actually resonate uh, that fast. Uh, you can see a typical one is in the range of 1 to 20 megahertz. And since CPUs uh, typically go in the gigahertz range, uh, you'd need some additional circuitry to scale up the frequency that comes off the crystal in order to get those gigahertz speed CPUs. Uh, but generally, uh, you are, can do this in sort of a variety of ways by tweaking out that circuitry, uh, perhaps in the BIOS uh, or startup sort of software uh, for your motherboard and, and uh, CPU. Uh, this carries some risks uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. Here is a circuit that is going to start a discussion, uh, albeit brief, of state. It's called an SR latch. And if you look at it for even more than a few moments, it should bug you just a little bit uh, with respect to the earlier circuits that we have talked about so far. An easy way to try to sort out why it's bothersome is to try to construct a truth table for it. If you would like, pause for a moment and try to do so but you'll be forgiven if you stumble just a little bit. Uh, what you'll notice as you try t uh, to establish like what is, is the truth value of Q uh, coming out of these two NOR gates. Uh, that's uh, an OR gate with a little dot uh, uh, not on the end of it, so NOR gate, uh, is the following, that in order to determine what comes out of this NOR gate, I have to look at R coming in, that's simple enough, and then trace this wire back to find that uh, it's coming uh, as the output of this uh, other NOR gate, which is F S as an input, uh, which also has this other wire coming in. If I trace back around, it's actually the output of the first NOR gate. Uh, so this thing is cyclic, it has feedback in it, and is therefore uh, troublesome uh, to establish a truth table for it in the absence of other information. Instead, the right way to analyze this thing is uh, using a state transition table instead. Due to the feedback, we'll find that some voltage level actually gets sort of stuck in this circuit. Now the um, specifics of exactly how that works are beyond the scope of this class. We'll look at some more details about it. But as a first pass, and start to understand uh, what is coming out of Q as this stateful uh, element, as in this is the output of the latch, uh, and it can be set and reset more or less, as in uh, set to a one and reset uh, back to a zero, as it were. But uh, based on the setup of this thing, whatever Q has as it's coming out at a moment uh, is going to be fixed. Uh, so long as the S and R bits, uh, short for set and reset, stay zero, then Q holds its output. So if Q has a one, uh, then it continues outputting one as long as S and R are zero. But if Q has a zero uh, coming out of it, uh, then S and R, as long as they're zero, it keeps put outputting zero. This is very different than those truth tables uh, because uh, the notion of what's coming out of this thing is dependence on some previous state for it. Uh, and this will give way then for us to store one bit of information uh, in this SR latch or some combination of thereof. Uh, if you have a set bit of zero and a reset bit uh, of one, uh, this is going to change what comes out of R uh, uh, to a zero instead. Uh, you might want to spend just a moment to sort of trace through how that might look, uh, but you can forgive your brain breaks a little bit uh, based on uh, the outputs there. Uh, and similarly, if you want to set the output to be a one, uh, then uh, make sure the S bit is up and the R bit is down. Uh, and this will, after a moment's delay, uh, ensure that what's coming out of Q is a one instead. Uh, <laughs> Interestingly, in hardware, there are some things that are supposedly off limits as well, uh, as in it's somewhat undefined what's going to happen in typical SR latches uh, if you put a one for both the set and reset bit, uh, as in uh, it's unclear what exactly is going to happen in any given case. So usually some circuitry prior to this prevents that from happening and defaults to one or the other uh, if that's what's coming in. A good hardware design would probably preclude this uh, in some way uh, as the hardware designers have control of how this circuit uh, fits into the rest uh, of the CPU where it resides. 
So then, there's a little bit of terminology that we should resolve. Um, an SR latch uh, is sometimes thought to store a bit, although there's another term uh, referred to as a flip-flop uh, that's also uh, associated with storing a bit. The bit that's stored is present until uh, as long as power is supplied to it. Uh, this isn't shown in any of the diagrams, but it's uh, implicit in most hardware designs. Uh, and the bit that is stored there can be changed, uh, albeit it's a little bit sort of contingent on whether you're talking about one circuit or another, or referred to as an SR latch or a flip-flop alternatively. We'll look at it ex as an example of this. Uh, but if you hear those two terms, uh, a latch, an SR latch uh, for set reset latch or flip-flop, know that it's some configuration like the ones that we're going to look at that is meant to form the basis of registers. And these are familiar to you from assembly as this special spot in the CPU that can actually store stuff. Uh, registers are separate from uh, main memory and we're about to dive into the actual circuitry that allows that storage to take place. Up top here in this somewhat complicated diagram is a block rendition of uh, one of those SR latches. Uh, we have one additional uh, bit that's coming in here, which is a clock uh, input. And so you can think back then uh, to these uh, XOR gates, uh, or sorry, uh, NOR gates uh, coming in uh, and comprising at least part of what's inside this latch one block and then duplicated over here for this uh, second uh, uh, latch block. Well, the addition of the clock input, and we're not going to talk exactly uh, about how that fits in uh, here to change uh, the inputs here, but um, uh, suffice to say, uh, the behavior that's desired, if you could uh, string these gates together, uh, is as follows, that we replicate the uh, S and R, set and reset uh, bits of business associated with the latch, so that I have a single ultimate output with these two latches strung together. Uh, and that output is contingent in some way on the input from the clock as well. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago uh, that the uh, clock has this rising and falling edge to it. Uh, the typical implementation you see in hardware at the gate level uh, is that these latches are going to change their outputs as the clock edge rises. And so you can see here in a timing diagram for this, a uh, clock starting out sort of nebulously, but then quickly resolving to rise and fall and then rise again and fall again and so forth. Uh, and a typical way that the design for these SR latch works is that if the S bit, the set bit is uh, present as one, uh, and the clock edge is rising, it's going to change the ultimate output for this uh, by virtue of the Y's and Y knots that are coming out of here, uh, and then going through the second latch to ultimately become the final output of Q over here. Uh, it's going to change those, uh, that uh, internal sort of um, gate uh, feedbacks uh, uh, along with the ultimate output Q uh, so that the bit is set uh, in a more or less permanent fashion. Uh, so let's have a look quick here. Uh, first, uh, the inputs for this in this little diagram here, they start out somewhat nebulously. Uh, and what you'll see then is this Y uh, connection here that's coming out of the first latch and going to the second latch uh, here along with its inverse uh, Y naught. Um, that starts out nebulously in the sort of middle state uh, here. Uh, but so long as we can guarantee that uh, I set the S and R bits to zero but initially, uh, then I get sort of nebulous behavior because uh, the Q value that's outputting here along with Y value that's uh, an inverse for it, um, that those two things uh, are nebulous up to the point of one of either S or R becoming high. Uh, and to that end, the S bit is the first one we'll examine here. It goes uh, just after 25 nanoseconds or so uh, high, uh, and we're keeping R low by this point. Now, so the sharp rise coming as an input, uh, perhaps uh, from, from some uh, selection bit or input bit that's elsewhere in the CPU. After a short delay, uh, you'll see then that the Y that's coming out of this thing goes high as well. Uh, and after a little bit longer delay, uh, towards the end of sort of the downward cycle in the clock, the Q output over here uh, goes high as well. At this point, it's safe to turn off that set bit because through feedback, we've essentially stored a one in the SR latch combination, uh, the flip-flop that's up here. Uh, 
To that end, then, having both the set and the reset uh, bits as zero here mean that what's coming out of Q, then, it stays high uh, until I tick up that reset bit over here, uh, at which point, after a short delay, the... Uh, the voltage propagates through this first latch, and I get a low in the Y output and a high in the Y naught, uh, and then that will trigger this second SR latch over here uh, to eventually, after another short delay, uh, change from storing a 1 to a 0. At that point, I can lower the R bit as well, and I've stored a 0 in the SR latch. Now, exactly how all this is working at the gate level, uh, that's, again, beyond the scope of what exactly we are responsible for in this stuff. But as a proof of concept, then, uh, what this is meant to demonstrate is that if you incorporate feedback into the circuitry, uh, along with careful use of these clocks and careful attachment of a couple SR latches together, you can get something that facilitates the storage of one bit. You can imagine that this is complex just to store one bit, but once you have that down and pat, the next obvious step is to replicate it. That if this circuit is good to store a single bit, uh, then you just duplicate it and you can start storing multiple bits. This is where uh, the notion of a register file comes in. Uh, that this block diagram over here as a register file is essentially comprised of a uh, four uh, different SR latch combinations. So each of these little dark blue shaded areas is one combination, perhaps, of one of these uh, master slave SR flip flops, uh, along with a connection to a clock circuit that's coming in over here. So this clock circuit is replicated to all of the SR latches in here. Uh, but we'll just group four of them together and say these are the bits of the A register, uh, AX in uh, this simplified scenario. And we'll have a separate group, uh, all of them independent, uh, but these will group together in some way to call the B register, the C register, and the D register. The register file itself then has to provide a couple different things. Uh, first, the clock and invisible as usual uh, power uh, to each of these things so that they uh, maintain uh, the data that's stored in there. Uh, and the clock then also becomes a way to um, sort of uh, set and reset uh, the uh, bits that are in each of these SR latches according to other inputs that are coming in. Uh, importantly, uh, over here are some read ports, and you'll notice uh, that a couple of them, are val A and val B, are being spit out. Uh, this is to uh, facilitate uh, assembly level instructions that usually take two operations. Uh, so some source bits come in to say where it is it that I, which of these four registers uh, do I want to output for val A, and which of these four registers do I want to output uh, for val B. Uh, for instance, Selection uh, zero, 00 might output uh, AX here, and selection uh, 10 uh, might output the tooth uh, register, CX in this case. And so in addition to their symbolic names, A, B, C, D, these are probably also numbered in some way, so they can be selected using these source bits. What's then come out, uh, what then comes out of the uh, Val A and Val B are the contents of that. Uh, Val A will probably have uh, four different wires uh, that are hooked up uh, to each of the bits that are in these um, uh, the flip flops that are about down here. Uh, but then the oneth or zeroth wire would probably connected to uh, the AX.1, BX.1, CX.1, DX.1, uh, and will arrange for only one of those to make their way out for the first wire of the valet, the second wire to the second bits in all of these, and so on. And so too for uh, Val B, connected to all of these as well, uh, just the selection bits here determine which of these uh, are going to be output. Uh, finally, then, usually registers have a way to change them. Uh, so coming in here will be some uh, destination bits, which say whatever's coming in on this wire, we're going to overwrite something over here. Uh, perhaps a particular uh, sequence of bits here say don't overwrite anything, that whatever instruction is being executed isn't actually going to change any of the registers here. But uh, so presuming that it is, these would go along the same way of like a zero, 00 would change AX. It would overwrite those uh, with whatever is here. And so as the clock rises, uh, these destination bits feed through to AX, uh, the val W um, uh, that's coming in. Uh, and each of the bits here, uh, are the val W stuff is fed in appropriately using those set and reset bits that we saw are also inputs to the latches. Uh, and one of those bits makes its way into the register AX over here uh, to set it for future use. Uh, 
there was quite a lot of selection uh, mentioned here. And so it should come as no surprise if you look at a more gate level diagram of this stuff, uh, which is uh, the next slide drawn out of a research paper on design of register files, uh, that there are a whole bunch of multiplexers involved here. Uh, that as you would want to read uh, some register, uh, for instance, the zeroth one AX over here, uh, in a 16 uh, sort of register file here, uh, then you need a 16 to 1 multiplexer uh, that would select out of all of these registers coming out, uh, which of them I'm actually going to pass through. Uh, and uh, to that end, you'd have four bits that are selecting. Uh, that would be these source A here, uh, and a second multiplexer that's connected uh, also to all of the registers that are present here. Four bits to select in this case, which of those 16 registers are going to come out of the, the, the multiplexer. And similarly, on the left-hand side, a 4 to 1 decoder, uh, this is another form of a multiplexer that selects which of the registers over here are actually going to get changed. You see a clock uh, circuit here uh, and a data in here that's connected that allows one to change all of these uh, with gates here dictating if uh, I'm not the one that's selected, then I'm not going to change according to this uh, data in set of wires. So you can see then that the principles you lay out, that once you can store one bit, then you can arrange access to it, you can start duplicating it, uh, and duplicating of uh, the single register into multiple registers over here. It also gives you an appreciation uh, that if you have to lay out something like this by hand, it explains why the original CPUs were only eight bits big, uh, that doing this by hand becomes tedious and error prone as you multiply out. So to, just to get a working CPU, you do something simple to start out with. But with the advent of machinery uh, that can compile and lay this stuff out using algorithms that run on computers, uh, then it's possible instead uh, to multiply this relatively quickly. Uh, it's no surprise then that the advent of computers makes building faster computers significantly uh, more easy. Just to wrap this up then, this uh, flip-flop business, complicated as it is, uh, is just something that I want everyone to understand uh, is an example of memory storage. And it's referred to as static RAM or SRAM. This SRAM technology, uh, its use of flip-flops and SR latches as the internal to store single bits, uh, it has some really good properties. Uh, for instance, it's fast, as in you can nearly instantaneously see uh, this is the output that's coming off the SR latch, a one or a zero. Uh, so it's low cost in terms of time. And that, that. And this is why it's used uh, in a lot of spots that are internal uh, to the CPU. That we'll see that the instruction memory that stores the bits associated with instruction memory, usually in a cache of some kind, uh, this uh, storage of these opcodes so they can be fed directly to the processor is usually uh, makes use of SRAM. And in generally, uh, most memory caches make use of SRAM technology because the idea of a cache, and we'll talk about this more in our discussion of the memory system, the idea of a cache is uh, that it is really fast. It's also the case that uh, certain uh, registers, like the RIP, importantly, must be stored in SRAM, that most of the register file that we've discussed, for instance, that RAX and RCX and RSP and so forth that we saw in the Intel architecture, those are all probably SRAM elements as well. Uh, finally, as we look ahead at more, somewhat more complex uh, CPU technology, there will be places on the insides of the CPU that aren't accessible to the programmer, that aren't part of the register file, but uh, need some storage for intermediate results between parts of the CPU. And typically this is made up of SRAM as well, in the interest of speed. Now the trade-off for this speed is that SRAM is fairly expensive. Uh, this is in terms of the amount of space it requires. The number of transistors and dates that you need to construct an SRAM is uh, considerable. Uh, that we started here with uh, a couple gates uh, that comprise a NOR, uh, 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 sorry, a couple gates, uh, NOR gates uh, that are, comprise the initial SR latch. You have to get a couple of those uh, SR latches together, along with inputs for clock uh, and not gate uh, for an output. Uh, and generally, the transistors are used uh, that are used uh, to manufacture this stuff. Uh, they don't reflect the NOR gate exactly right, and so it'll take some more transistors to, to set that up. More transistors and more gates means more physical area that is required for the SR latch. Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, it's not the case that SRAM is used for your main memory, uh, the typical RAM chips that you would buy uh, to plug onto a motherboard uh, in, a, in a computing system, uh, which are separate and outside of the processor. Instead, this will be a different technology called DRAM or dynamic RAM. Uh, dynamic in this case is actually a drawback and that the SRAM notion here, static, doesn't mean you can't change it. In fact, you can change it and usually change it quite fast. It just means that the output for the circuit that stores the bit is stable over time. As long as you keep it powered, it always spit out the one or the zero uh, that you put in there. Dynamic in this case means if you wait long enough, uh, the bit that you stored in this DRAM business actually fades away. And so in order to maintain a one or a zero that is present in those DRAMs, you occasionally have to refresh it, as in read out what's stored in there and write it back. Uh, this is going to account for some time and some power expense associated with DRAM. Uh, it's a slower technology, but we'll find that it takes fewer transistors and is therefore uh, able to scale up to storing gigabytes uh, rather than the mere kilobytes or megabytes that SRAM is uh, typically uh, used for. Uh, and so this is how your modern computing system like a laptop is able to store uh, so much memory uh, in main memory as by using a slower uh, but cheaper and more compact storage uh, system. We'll see that this phenomenon is uh, present at many, many levels in the memory hierarchy. Uh, that beyond DRAM is the uh, much more abundant but slower uh, and cheaper disk space. Uh, and beyond that, then uh, you start to go things like cloud storage that are farther away and cheaper from the dollars and cents perspective, uh, but slower usually to access than things that are local. That will conclude our discussion today. Now, we've covered a considerable amount of ground, uh, including uh, overviewing a few of the circuits uh, that comprise addition and arithmetic, and also alluding to selection circuits like the multiplexer. We then moved on uh, to discuss the limits of those combinatorial circuits and overviewed how you introduce notions of time and states uh, into a computing system using things like a quartz crystal that oscillates uh, and an SR latch that uses feedback in order to store bits. Most of these things we're treating at a very high level. So if my presentation seems a bit hand wavy, this should give you the impression uh, that you don't need to know the complex details that are associated with this. Most of those are uh, associated with an entire degree in computer engineering. Uh, in order to understand the bits and pieces that are present there, you'd have to devote a considerable more time. But at a high level, at least, you should be convinced now that none of this is magic, that notions of doing work in using uh, electrons can be accomplished by the right combination of gates uh, and incorporation of these time and state elements to produce computing systems. Our next step are to tie a lot of this together to start looking at the whole CPU and then talk about why uh, the main CPU uh, that we would design naively uh, turns out to be slow, too slow and how notions of pipelining and superscalar uh, performance uh, can be used uh, to rectify that and improve the performance of standard CPUs. For that though, I'll have to leave off for now and catch you next time.